Hello, everybody. Welcome to our LA County Library virtual event, Creative Career Paths. I'm Caroline Chang, Arts Program Manager at LA County Library, and I will be your host today. Uh, this program is a part of a series exploring careers in the entertainment, film, TV, and media industries. And today, director and producer Kimberly Browning will have a conversation with music composer Joey Newman. All right, I'm going to start by introducing our presenters today, but while I'm doing that, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you. So please uh, drop a hello to us in the chat and share with us what you're hoping to get out of the conversation today or where you are in your career journey. So first, I'd like to introduce Kimberly Browning, who will be moderating our conversation. Kimberly is a filmmaker based in LA and is the founder and festival director of Hollywood Shorts Film Festival, which launched in 1988. She's an associate short film programmer at Tribeca Film Festival and a senior programmer at Catalyst Content Festival. She has been the executive producer of HBO Access since 2015 and is now part of the new Warner Media Access Programs team, developing emerging writers and directors in episodic television. And we also have Joey Newman with us today. Uh, he is an Emmy nominated third generation film and television composer of the famed Hollywood musical Newman Dynasty. Joey earned his music degree from the Berklee College of Music and got his start working in television, composing the Emmy winning, uh, co composing with Emmy winning composer W.G. Snuffy Walden. Joey has composed the music to award-winning feature films, including Any Day Now and The Space Between, numerous television series, including ABC's The Middle, CBS's All Rise, and Disney Plus's Diary of a Future President, video games, including Lineage, and providing uh, provided arrangements for recording artists like Rufus Wainwright and Broadway composers Marcy and Zena and Cinco Paul. As a conductor and orchestrator, Joey has worked across the media spectrum, including orchestrating for his cousin Randy, Bill Ross, and conducting alongside Michael Tilson Thomas and John Williams. And with that, I will hand it over to Kimberly to start us off. I'm so excited to have my colleague and my friend and my brother in film, Joey. It's so great to have you. Thank you so much for making the time to join us today. Um, I just know everything that you've been through in your life and your journey and your career and knew it would just be so informative and inspiring for our audience. So thanks for being here. My pleasure. My awesome. pleasure. It's good to see you, yeah. Kimberly. It's good to see you too. Yeah. Um, so I would love to, I guess, start at the beginning. I think a lot of people think when you have a family that's been in a part of the business for a long time, um, you're either gonna veer completely away from it <laughs> um, or that it's um, a smooth road. And I think those are both kind of misconceptions. So can you talk a little bit about what your own musical journey was and when did, oh, I'm gonna be a composer kind of ignite for you? So um, I have been playing music my whole life. As far as I can remember, I've been, uh, my, Newman is my maternal name, which is where my my grandfather Lionel uh, had three daughters, and my mom was the youngest. And then, funny enough, my dad is also a musician from Hamilton, Joe Frank, and Reynolds, a '70s band. So, I have had music on both sides. But I guess ultimately, uh, drumming was where it kind of started for me. That was just the most natural thing I did. And I guess I gravitated towards more what my dad's world was like as he was an R&B and funk and all this, you know, lover of that kind of music and his band was in that zone. And um, I, I just love that. So I grew up with a mom who was a ballerina who would listen to everything from Toto to Tchaikovsky and uh, my dad listening to, you know, any old blues to Tower Power. So it's like, I always grew up around that kind of music yet always knowing that my grandfather and his brothers and, and of course my cousins were doing this whole thing. So as a lover of entertainment and being around the entertainment business, um, it's always there. But my focus at that time was as a performer, I think. And so when I was about 15, I decided this was going to be my career. I was so passionate about music overall, but I wanted to be a session drummer or a studio drummer, go on tour or something like that. Um, so I actually went to Berkeley College of Music as a performance major. Um, however, right before I graduated high school, I did a friend, um, a friend of my mom's was a UCLA drama student or film student. And ended up, I ended up kind of scoring his thesis or short, his last, and it was really fun. I, I did it on piano and it was just my kind of first foray into composing. I, I'd always played piano as a second instrument. I studied that as well, but I never um, decided that that was going to be something I was really going to do until 
I was about, I got into Berkeley and then a few years later, I said, this is what I really want to do is right. I just, I love playing, but playing wasn't for me going to be uh, what defined my musical career. I had too many other interests. And so film scoring and film composing, composing in general for media offered uh, openings of everything. You could use any style. You could be as creative as possible. You could hire, you know, great musicians. It was kind of the full package for me. That's incredible. And yeah. so what did you, what do you, if you look back on it, you know, what was your, the opportunity or the door that you first opened to kind of get that first step into composing, especially if you had an entire community of people that identified you as a drummer, yeah. um, especially, yeah. uh, uh, to step into that world of composing, what was the first thing that you jumped at or the first opportunity that came to you that you said yes unexpectedly to? How did you get started? Yeah. Um, so after I got out of school, uh, I came back to LA um, and I was actually engaged uh, to my wife. So we met in college. So I had a whole other side of my personal life going on at the same time as trying to develop a career. And none of those are easy. Uh, obviously, composing in general is a solitary kind of vibe half the time. And, um, you know, you're everything isn't here. So as if you're a writer for, you know, you're, you're creating a show, you're creating the music, everything starts here, everything lives here, and then eventually gets out. And the hard part is that it doesn't ever really shut off. There's a beauty about that and also a curse of not being able to kind of like in the middle of the night, you're like, oh, right, this, or you're up all night or whatever it might be. When I got out of school, um, I needed a job. So I just worked. Like I was working at retail, like at Adidas store, Banana Republic, things like this, just to make a living until I finally found an assistant job. Um, so I had gone and uh, interviewed for this guy, W.G. Snuffy Walden, who's a great composer who I love from the Wonder Years and 30 something. And he was on the Wyndham Hill label doing all these guitar things, which I love guitar growing up, hence all these guitars, even though I'm not a guitarist. Um, I'm just a huge fan. And so uh, he gave me a shot to be a studio guy there. So when I, I started cleaning out his shed, you know, getting lunch, you name it from the so ground. You literally up, took a production assistant job in his shop. I took a studio assistant job at his shop. Um, and then about, I'd say almost a year in, I got a chance to show him because I had already showed him some of my music right out of college, but I had no real credits. Um, so he allowed me to start to work in, you know, I, I learned about all the gear he was using, all the computer programs. Um, even though I learned about that at school, it was a surface touch, you know, you don't really dig in until you actually really need to. Um, so that's when I was like, wow. And I was on the cutting edge between old analog and digital too. So all the new digital stuff was kind of just blowing up during that time from late nineties, early two thousands. So um, it, it was great. He, uh, he, you know, I went from, uh, copying music because I see that was the thing I wanted to learn everything so I learned how to to copy music I learned how to write it I learned how to do takedowns which are called was when we take hear audio and then copy it out there's no um you know like if someone plays something or if he's playing a guitar like I have to do that by ear and then right. uh, all these different skill sets came to play I started doing that then I got into kind of orchestration I got a little bit more into working in the synths department and sounds and that and then I finally got a shot to be able to write something. And that really started my career off. When he gave me my first, uh, which was extremely generous of a guy at his stature, he gave me my first screen credit. It changed my career. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So when you were coming out, even going to a music program, did you know about the different jobs that are kind of within the composition world? People don't realize music editor, that a copyist is a yeah. full-time well-paid gig um, and yeah. that people spend their career being copyists and that there's a specific role for them in film, TV, and video games. So how did, did you just kind of organically learn the thing and then kind of figured out, oh, this is a copyist and this is a gig? Or how well, did that evolve? Yeah, perfect, perfect question. Because the benefit about my situation um, was that I was very aware of all of the different jobs because of my family. So, um, you know, if you're a film scoring buff, 
in general, for soundtrack nerd or whatever it's going to be, you're going to look at all the credits and you're going to realize that we, you know, as the one composing team employs hundreds of people uh, to make sometimes all these big movies work. Um, so I learned about all of these things. And during my junior year of college, when I came back for the summer, I ended up working at a music copy house called Joanne Kane Music Service. They're still sure. around. Yeah, and I was a librarian there, and I learned, I mean, not that was like, I think I learned way more than I ever would have. I learned about the copyist world. I learned about the librarian world, which is a whole other world. Um, yeah. I learned about the union and how they pay and what it's what these agreements mean. I learned about, um, and I was able to go to sessions, and I was able to witness and look at the scores. It was like, it was like going to school, you know? It was incredible. Very fortunate, obviously, to have that kind of experience happen. But all of those things led me to understand that not only are we all one team doing this, but there are many facets to it that people can do, which is pretty exciting. You don't have to be that top guy with all the CEO in a sense of it all. You could be, there's plenty of space to do other things and do other interesting things. Absolutely. It's the most exciting time. It's the best time. Yeah. to come into the space of both the studio level and independent music post jobs. Um, yeah. I want to say careers. I think there's so many unsung heroes. You see the composer who gets an Oscar on the, well, composer's not even going to get their word on the broadcast anymore. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't want to get really sidetracked. Yeah. But I think the composer represents, like you just said, so many great positions, but job positions. I mean, really career oriented, really creative positions. But I get excited because a lot of um, people who don't necessarily have virtuosic performance musical backgrounds are finding great careers in the music space because they're organized, because they're patient, because they love music, because they have an encyclopedic appreciation and knowledge for scoring mm -hmm. right and and yeah. that knowledge base can lead to having the skill set to be a librarian to to work at a jingle house there's so many great ways to lead in so this is really helpful hearing how you chose your path for sure yeah i um i think the uh the joanne k music service uh skill sets are i still use all the time even if it's organization, even if it's, um, you know, I have had to do my own parts for musicians and I'm extremely clean. I'm fast. I know how to kind of get these, you know, like going on uh, to the, to the minutia of knowing how to tape and bind a score for mm. sessions where it doesn't fall apart when you lift it up. Old Things school. of that nature. Things that you don't even think are important yeah. until you're on the, the podium and you do something and it falls apart during the middle and you're like, what is going on? I mean, it's, it's amazing so the minutia you can learn. Yeah. So, sure. they're, they're, yeah. Yeah. and that's amazing. And so, um, just as a sidebar that just came to me, as you are, uh, just to give everybody some insight of your perspective, mm -hmm. you are a composer. Do you also conduct? Because there yes. are composers who do not. So, I want to come from that space of people understanding your POV. That's correct. Uh, you do not have to be a conductor to be a composer in, to, in today's film media world or tell, you know, anything. Um, it's a skill set that I wanted to, I, I guess, as a drummer moving into the orchestral world, too. It was it seemed the logical thing for me. You know, you're you're the middle of the group. You're the you're you you witness it all from the drummer's standpoint, witness it all from the conductors. There's a, obviously a rhythm. There's movement of the hand. It's very much like, oh, I mean, I know other drummers who are conductors are very good. So it, it's a great kind of thing. That. Yeah. Yeah. So that that part is um that was my personal choice. I took everything I could at Berkeley while I had the chance. Um and then when I came out here, I also I entered a um at the time I was with a performing rights organization in BMI and they had a conductor's workshop and I did that. And I actually met a lot of great long lasting friends in that in particular, my concert master. Um, and it was just exciting to be able to, you know, work with different size groups in a more professional setting here in LA and things like that. Um, you know, un unfortunately we don't get as much opportunity as we used to, to conduct cause orchestras are, you know, we only get so many budgets and so much time, but, um, Again, that skill set offered me a whole other, you know, set of 
thoughts and, and feelings and wanting to be out there and emotionally connect to musicians and all of that stuff. And, but at the same time, you can hire somebody who can yeah. use great conductors for hire. I was a conductor for hire for other composers um, as well. And I put on my, you know, conductor hat and become a complete team member, not just a composer, but somebody who is helping the composer in so many different ways to interpret that music. And yeah. um, another great, another great thing you can, one can do still and not, you know, have to compose. You can be a conductor for hire too. So, yeah, that's great insight. Um, and it's important that people know that because I don't think it's discussed really candidly that those things can be um, mutual or, and I, and I think that composers that conduct have a different way of working than those yeah. who don't. And depending upon your film or your show or your video game, sometimes it's beneficial to have a, a composer that just composes. And sometimes I think it's really great that somebody who's going to be in the whole pipeline with me. Yeah. Who, right. So. Um, that's really exciting to, yeah. to kind of share that information. I want sure. to talk art artistically a little bit. And as we start to go through your job opportunities as you were launching your career, how I want to talk about the artistic side of it. How, what did you do to figure out as you were writing what your voice was, what your tone was, what your when we're starting out, so much of our work as musicians is playing other people's work. And many times, first conductor gigs is conducting other people's work. Stepping into the space of original composition, original scoring, particularly for film and television. How do you begin to identify what's you and what's your voice and what exercises or what process did you do artistically to discover what your what your deal is, what you're into as a composer, as a writer? That's a great question. Um, I guess, you know, funny enough, my cousin Tom Newman is one of my favorite composers anyway, um, aside from him being related to me. But I think for many of my my buddies in our time frame, when Shawshank Redemption came out, we love the film, we love the score, uh, something about that kind of music uh, just spoke to me differently than a John Williams or Jerry Goldsmith score, which are also fantastic. But um, there's so many other types of music and his smaller, more intimate approach with also ability to have a large scale orchestral sound over it or whatever, but almost reversing it using the band as the core and the orchestra as the color um, was really, I, I think, a unique kind of thing. And because I was learning so much at school to work with small ensemble, that I had to kind of start from that zone, but I was a band guy. So that was not too hard for me. It was more about listening to colors and understanding that kind of thing, which was something I enjoyed. When I came back uh, to LA thinking like, oh, you know, I've got this reel, I can do all this. Um, I had really no idea what my musical voice was at all. I, I didn't know, ultimately, you know, my, my training, my feeling was, I probably should know everything I possibly can because if I get a job, I can get different types of jobs. Or if someone asked me to do a big band chart, or if someone asked me to do, you know, a rock metal tune, like you have to kind of be able to do anything. That was what I thought at the time um, was going to get me more work, or the job really was. Little did I know, to some extent, even having a cousin like Randy, who pretty much, you know, has his partic particular sound and gets hired to do that, um, I just had to keep searching. And I think when I end up working for Snuffy, uh, that was my first experience in a, uh, a shop that had a couple other composers. And we did have to find a way to sound like the palette, like the sound that he creates, but I'll find our voice within that. Um, that was challenging because, you know, you have to kind of follow those lines that he's already created or sometimes do things in that zone. And I was also a fan. So he was a not only mentor, but I sonically enjoyed you know, I wanted to kind of yeah. do things like that. Um, and then uh, you have to find a way to, I guess, like the same folks who might work in Hans Zimmer's world, you have to find a right. way to build your own voice out of that. And it's not easy. Right. Um, I, you know, I still think I, a lot of sensibilities that I learned there, I still use and other concepts, but um, it just took time. I think it took, it's going to take no matter who you are, um, it takes a lot of time to figure out what specifically you have to say, and also I think who you are personally, yeah. emotionally, physically, where you're at within your world is going to say something. Or, you know, if I think if you're, it's funny, it's like if you're kind of a, uh, 
people pleasing type of personality, your music might just service everything in that zone too. But if you if you're very you know if you have a specific opinion, but you're still a collaborator, which is kind of where I try to go. I, I try to look at every project as a, a kind of a clean slate, and at the same time picking instrumentation or picking things that would make sense for the project, working in tandem with the filmmakers because it's their baby or it's whoever it might be, and I want to come into that and just offer my services and my take. And then whatever stamp I'm going to put on it, I'm kind of finding at the same time. So I guess in so many ways, even at my stage of my career, I still love to just uh, see if there's a way that I can kind of experiment and venture into places I've never been and see what happens, you know? <laughs> so yeah. it's it takes, but it takes a while, you know? It takes time to develop that. I think it takes time to figure that out. Um, and also what it is that maybe you really love. Some people come in, they say, I, I want to do horror movies. I want to do you know, action adventure. I want to do Marvel. That's kind of my thing. And then they get a job, maybe assisting a TV guy who does something different. And then all of a sudden they find themselves doing more in that kind of zone and it kind of turns them. It's kind of what happened to me. I, I wanted to, you know, I got my first video game, my first feature at the same time when I was working at Snuffy's and also I had got my first chance to write on TV. So I had all of these windows with three completely different types of things. And I was married at that and, and got married at that time frame, the end of 99 or middle of 99. And then uh, I chose the TV route mainly because I knew how successful it could be if you kept at it watching the guy I was working for. And right. financially, I wanted a little something more solid that I felt like, you know, if I'm chasing films, I may not be able to, to get there. So my risk factor the way that I decided it was different from other composers. Some guys, single guys, other people even with families, they're gonna shoot this way. I decided to go this other direction. Um, and I never regret my decision, but at the same time, uh, you know, it it is what it is. Like you have to at some point also, <laughs> you're, you know, you, you're prepared, the doors open in different ways as you keep out there doing things. And then you gotta, you gotta just go on your path, see where it takes you. Absolutely. And so in a, in a pragmatic sense, when you were having those opportunities, did you take footage from existing film and write your own stuff? How much of that was balanced from finding short films? Like, how did you really just, you know, do your work daily? What are you writing to when you were first starting out? Yeah, I think, well, the nice thing about going to a, a music school with a program like that is I was able to do all of those things there. I st at least, you know, I did the final project as a short film. Uh, you do scenes and different things throughout there, some with live musicians, some not, or whatever, you know, however you want to go about it. Yeah. So at least I felt like I had a, a I had a good concept surface-wise, and I knew enough and I'd seen enough to know how things go. Um, but yes, as per normal, the first thing you end up doing half the time is writing in a box, and you know, I'm. <laughs> I work on a computer and that's where like, you know, your first stuff is kind of coming along. Um, and uh, so I guess that's kind of really how I, you know, I did everything acoustically as I could at school orchestration wise by ear, all that stuff. But the minute you come into the film music business, your time frame is so short to be able to get everything done on budget, on time, and the computers became you know, God to this whole thing. So, uh, you and it made, that, you yeah. were in that last four years of analog to digital. So it really, that's right. It yeah, really you, shifted gears. Yeah. I mean, literally while I was working for Snuffy for six years, we went from 24 track analog tape to D88 to, to hard drives with messengers to upload. I mean, it's like the, ama the amount, it was so fast to me how things kind of went. Considering um, how long we were doing it the OG way for so long without so any long. changes. Yeah. And, um, so many of my friends that I went to, I again was a performance major like you were, and I shifted yeah. halfway through and went into film uh, halfway through my career and went to film and TV. Um, and so similarly, I think my last, my last year of school was the year that the synth came out, right? <laughs> So all these people that spent all this money with these big performance degrees, we went from, you know, I wanted to be in Studio A mm -hmm. and had visions of being in the big room with John Williams. And within a year of us graduating college, there was a writer's strike 
and um, the the synth pick come out. So you went from two month gig to two days of just going in and sampling clarinet for them. <laughs> Right. And so mm -hmm. you were at that next kind of technological impact. Talk a little bit. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're always learning, we're always growing. What do you feel has been the software that you that you has carried you through that you that's essential? How do you keep up with tech? How has tech impacted our business? I think it's blown the doors open because I think there's an accessibility. I know people who are really, really good at computers and IT that have now a really vibrant career in this sector. And then they learn the art, the artist part, right? Because they're really, really good with just how to how to work the system. Right. Yeah. Uh, when I was at uh, Berkeley, we they they used uh, digital. Well, they used Performer at the time, which is from Mark sure. the Unicorn, um, and Pro Tools. Those were kind of the two big big tech, uh, you know, software device. And then they spoke a little bit about since at some point, um, uh, I guess for during my time there, it was mainly external boxes um, and not plugins as we call them now, which uh, changed the, again, changed the face, everything too. So um, I, I've been using that, you know, I, tr I tried to switch a few times. I think I just really related best to that particular program. Now, you don't have to. That's not, I mean, the other big ones are Logic and Cubase. Those are probably the two other major, uh, probably the two top, really, major um, sequencers the that most people are using. used. Yeah. Um, and, and unusual, uh, I find that to be on the indie side and the studio side. For a lot of other departments, you might find indie projects or video games tend to use different software, but it's yeah. really interesting, the cohesion on the music side, that if yeah. you learn the basic stuff, you can work in any sector you end up going into. It seems really consistent. Exactly. I think the interesting part is like, for example, um, my, you know, as Berkeley went on, um, they even offered, now you kind of have to go in there with a laptop and they give, there's like a package of, you know, software you get. When I think about that, uh, as going into even in, into school or some any school to, you know, that you have to basically know a certain amount of all of this just to kind of like jump into the to the to the thing. It's, it's um, like the in, as a textbook, you the like way you they yeah. say get your books between class. Here are the things, yeah. So the list you listing what these are is really good for everybody to know because these are things. Sometimes they have student yeah. free downloads or student yeah. versions of these. Um, and the library, if you are starting out, you want to start getting familiar with this. Caroline's going to talk later. The library has resources, so you don't necessarily have to have. When I started out, you had to have a big fancy system and yeah. literally a laptop. And um, if you don't have access to a high speed laptop or Wi Fi, the library has a lot of resources to help. And Caroline will talk about that later. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It, it, I mean, I, you could definitely get along with just a few things and get working, I guess, you know, one of yeah. them being one of those main sequencers. Um, and then even if you just bought, you know, Native Instruments, which is a, a company that makes Contact, which is a kind of a host, you know, uh, host instance that can take a bunch of different libraries built for it. Um, you can do that and you can, you can buy different ones and get pretty much anything just through that and start moving. Um, I think most software nowadays seems pretty intuitive. It's sell, uh, it's it's not as uh, difficult as it was when we were learning, and it's yeah. not costing as much as it was. Like you were saying, I mean, we spend you know tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars just well, to have all of these things. Now your computer might cost a lot, but that almost is it, you know. So really, that's that's great. And if it, you know, I don't know what kind of resources the library has on that front, but that would be amazing to have a few of those things even or just a little like we used to have a little center at school that was a little workstation, you know, they had a computer a pair of headphones, a couple pieces of, you know, and like an audio interface so we could do something and listen and then just start creating. So that yeah. um, that's how all of us did it. And that, that that's how everybody gets to understand and learn that software. Now you could be of any type. I mean, I'm, I'm, also, I'm also coming from specifically that film scoring space. You could be any type of artist you want and come into this business. You can use, you know, people use all kinds of other kinds of software too, or doing stuff live. 
and come into this business. You could be a DJ and come into this business. You could be, you know, whatever it, it, it is, it. all of your, yeah, all of that stuff so can work. Trent into Reznor, it. right? Exactly. Exactly. Oscars. Truly. And he's just a yeah. punk rock, burn it all down guy. One of the things I guess that's interesting is that, you know, the main thing is most recording artists or whatever, you know, a lot of them like to get into this world for many reasons. One is it's a storytelling world, right? I'm a storyteller. These, you know, you're a songwriter, you know, all of these people have something to say. We also uh, gravitate towards visuals and we want to put those things together and it, it's inspiring. Um, when uh, I, I think, uh, a rock artist or, uh, you know, a, a pop artist, somebody comes in from a world that they don't know the craft of it, because yeah. that's really the difference is that, you know, I understand all the logistics behind it, all the mechanics behind how to get, you know, our music into the hands of that film or that, that project. Um, sometimes then I have, I get paired up with them to kind of, we collaborate to make that work because they don't have those skill sets yet. They are the ones with the track, with the name, right? It could be a big artist and you're like, yeah, that, that person's selling our movie, but they don't really know actually how to get. The, the technical. Part, and yeah. the so well, jobs like, like that are very helpful for people, not only in composing, but assistant wise too. You know? And I think the jobs that I think about, which most people don't even hear about, you know, assistant to the composer mm -hmm. sounds like you're picking up coffee and donuts, but it's not. And um, I think arranging slash orchestration, which has changed a lot because of technology. There's, when I was starting out, but what mattered the most if you wanted to be an orchestrator was your penmanship and how you mm. could literally write music on the score sheet, right? And yeah. do it all day long. That's, yeah. not the, that's not the barrier to entry anymore. Right. So yeah. It's exciting because I think it really, it be it little do demo you know makes it more democratic to all these different new points of view and cultural inspired places that that you get to work with all the time now i mean you literally get a job that needs irish dance and some african folk music and there's so many more people you can find to bring into your team to give you that language and those flavors exactly um, yeah, exactly. so it's kind of exciting time. So yeah. that's really helpful. So for those of you who are listening, we are going to provide a list that Caroline's going to put together a really great package. It's going to get emailed to everybody that registers for the seminar. And it's going to have a lot of the things we're going to talk about, links and resources, and some of the names of the software that we're talking about today and their websites so you can explore. So for those of you frantically taking notes that are afraid you missed something, don't worry. We're going to put it all together and aggregate it and send you a really cool resource um, list that'll that'll help you out. So. Um, I want to stay in the, the artistry component of this as you moved out of at what, you know, you could work with somebody like Snuffy's company forever, right? They're a company that touches everything. And there are people who live their whole careers working for a bigger composer. Um, what, at what stage was it time for you to evolve, move on? kind of take, take us through that next step and and when was that time and why? Towards the, I think it was towards the uh, end of my time there. I think I had done everything I could possibly do there from orchestrating on his stuff to co-writing. Um, and I, I had gained enough experience and it just organically felt like the right time to go. And um, at, in about, I guess about, yeah, a year or so, I left around 2005, six, but around 2004, I ended up getting an opportunity to get my own show. It just, I, I, I lucked your out. Your own show, explain that for everybody, your own television yeah. show. It was a show that had been on the air for a while, or was it a new show? So he, my first credit with Snuffy was on um, the show called Once and Again. And that was the first time I'd kind of been brought into the process. We both went to the music spots together and in a music spot, is where you get together with the producers, the director, and discuss where music is going to come in and out. And uh, we'd have those weekly because we'd have episodes 
you know, coming up weekly. Um, and I had had that experience, uh, it really, and working with great people, which was extremely fortunate to be able to kind of get that and watch that and see how it worked. I um, was able to watch Snuffy work and see how his mind worked with, I, I was able to, to uh, listen to him on the phone, talk to clients, talk to his agents, things like that. And I had an agent at the time too, that was through a family friend, um, being that, you know, my grandfather was very close with uh, an agent in town does not mean, and I do not recommend you get agents right away. It's just for my situation, what just was that. Um, so I had a little bit more, I guess, a little bit more help to kind of do that, but I had to work really hard to try to get this show and go through many different stages. It was a show that was brand new on CBS and I was doing the, uh, just was doing the pilot and then it got picked up. Um, but it, it was. Even though I was so young, and that was my first time that uh, that they actually hired another composer, and we alternately did episodes to so make sure. So they were covering themselves in case. I think that's the way they like to work, and I think that's also was to make sure that I could deliver that. The bonus was they were covered if you were still a bit green. Exactly. You know, you're somebody who had a lot of, we talk about work-life balance here a lot, mm. and your career um, happened, you got the married and the kids in the house thing pretty early on, which added extra responsibility for you. And it helped, as you mentioned, make your choices different. Mm -hmm. So how did you navigate that personal side of, I do have, you can't take as many bungee jumps as some, but he's single, right? Um, leaving the nest of a shop and a nest of a shop with one of the top guys in town, okay. you're making a pretty good living for somebody that's in the composer pool um, to, to jump out, not just on a show, but on a pilot that you had no guarantee was gonna get picked up. So can you talk yeah. about the holistic component of when you knew it was right for you to take that kind of chance? Had you been saving up to make the move? Had you been planning it? You know, talk about the logistics of Joey Newman music business, you know? There's a, to me, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a fun story about real, it was a real, um, it, it hit me as I, I had had all this, the, I, I guess the, the, the word to use would be, uh, ex expectations. I had all of these expectations of what it was going to look like to do all of these things. And, and, uh, you know, if it would be, if I could do it, if they would believe in me enough, if I had what it, what it took to do it. Um, and then I'll tell you the story that I think is just the best part about life in general. But I, um, when I, when I got this pilot and then I ended up getting the series, but the pilot, so again, I'm living in an apartment with my wife, uh, you know, getting paid. Okay. Like you said, and doing, doing well, you know, one of the things also, which, you know, is something to think about down the line is also, which is changing now, but I, I had an access to a royalty or residual money that was kind of helpful too. Right, we're going to talk about. about that. Yeah, but um, as I was going through that, so you had worked I, on enough stuff. That we're getting some revenue from some residuals that were coming in, so it gave you a little bit of financial stability. Exactly. Okay. And then I and and so, but I didn't have a studio, and my assumption was that looking at Snuffy's place you that was so big. Yeah, didn't logistically, yeah, logistically, where are you going to be? Working out of your bedroom, out. exactly. Mm -hmm. I end up, um, uh, we. His place was so beautiful, and I, you know, would never have anything like that. Sometimes I was able to either, you know, have a client come to his place, or sometimes I was able to go to another composer who had a really nice studio in Burbank. And then for this one, it just didn't work out that way. I, I had to have this new executive producer who's been on many things, who's had a huge career, come to my place. And at that time, I had it in my my mom's old townhouse. In, a be in my old bedroom that had been gutted that she basically, when I moved out, turned into something else. Luckily, she was like, sure, you can put your studio in here temporarily, which I did until I could find a place. And this guy comes in at, late at night. My mom is sleeping in the next bedroom watching TV. He up, goes up the stairs, little tiny thing. He sits in, you know, because I have all this gear because it's the stuff is so, you know, we had all these boxes and all these huge things. And he's kind of bumped up against the those, uh, you know, wooden uh, yeah. closet things, which, which yeah. by the way, was not tight. So if he hit it too hard, it would have fallen and hit him on the head. And I'm like, 
oh my God, he's in this room. This is just it. He is, he's I'm gonna, never going to work again. I'm never going to work. He's going to think I can't do this. It's going to be the worst. He's listening on headphones because I can't put on the speakers because my mom's asleep. You know, I'm like, oh my God, I'm in my, my mom is next. I was like, it couldn't have been any worse. But the beauty of this guy was that he listened to the music and that's all he cared about. He, he's like, if it's working, it doesn't matter. All this other stuff. It really changed my view on the fact that I didn't have to fight so hard to try to have everything right away just to fit in. Um, if you are, you know, a collaborator, a great, a, a good person who, who's genuine and authentic about what they're doing straight up. And you know what? You might find people who just, they don't really care. Cause you know what? Maybe they had the same thing. I mean, you know, we've all grown up in the way we've grown up. It doesn't matter. But if you have the heart and you have the talent, people can see through that. That's just, I think the beauty of people who can champion you and who could see through all of the other Michigas and they go, yeah, no, this is working for me. Bye. And they don't care where you're doing it. You know, I was like, it, it, it changed my whole view. I was like, wow, I can actually do this and not feel so, you know, unworthy of all of it, you know? Right. Yeah. That's such a great story. It's so perfect for what we're talking about. Yeah. I think now more than ever, um, we get to benefit from a lot of top execs and a lot of decision makers and a lot of the stigma of home studios, a yeah. lot of the stigma that we think they're expecting of us. Um, you know, these times have really broken a lot of those chains. Yeah. Uh, in terms of everybody was working at home and everybody was piecing together their home studios. And and um, hearing you say that, in addition to the new mindset that I think we're all going back into production on, yeah, is really exciting. And that your work and your artistic integrity and you just hearing what the director is trying to say is what really, truly matters. And it anybody is. Who it is or is it about your client kitchen? All right. You know, is it maybe necessarily the right fit for what you're working on? That's so that's perfectly said. So perfectly said, Kimberly. I mean, I think that's the deal. You don't have to have the fancy stuff to make great music and to work in this business. And, you know, there always are going to be people who want that and are going to work with clients who love that. And that's just that world. But it is not uh, a, a requirement where I think when we all came out, at least in my world, I really felt like we had to compete that that was the way that we could compete with the big guys now everybody yeah. i think is like you said i think we've much more leveled everybody's playing field um because i think once tv became even much more with like the streamers and netflix it became the big thing that everybody's watching even more than films sometimes so you know everybody as you know the composer world now just goes between all of it uh so really you can do much more fluid for sure. Much more fluid. But, you know, doesn't mean that all the skill sets are the same within those. But yes, the fact that you can go to all of them and nobody goes, oh, you're just a TV composer or you're just this, you know, it's that stigma is now it's much more you're you can do all Way these gone. different media things. Yeah. Celebration around even video game music now is so exciting. Fantastic. Um, yeah. And I also feel like the AR VR space are opportunities when people are looking for that first step job that first open door um i love encouraging people to look at like you started as a music shop people um maybe don't think about every i think sometimes there's the perception i have to get my first job with a really famous composer really powerful composer and there are so many sh ways that you could go to a boutique shop mm -hmm. that's doing post or a music library like you were talking about right. i also think jingle shops people that are doing branded content advertising um and working in jingles you actually probably get to touch a lot more of the process faster and get your own work out there faster uh and people don't even think that there's getting a job sweeping floors at those places you were going to get in quick if you can put sentences together and you've got a couple of good samples and you pick your, you know how to listen and observe and know when that opportunity is there to say, I can do that. Mm -hmm. That sometimes happens even faster at the boutique places that are churning a lot of sports content, music content, even music video shops need some great post people. 
and it yeah. gives you the skill set because you wouldn't think music videos. I'm not. I'm a, I want to be a composer, but you still need to learn the tech. You need to learn the workflow. You're going to be and a lot of those music editing jobs happen, and right. you learn how to do it so that you have some credit and have some people, like you said, who are going to endorse you for that next opportunity. So yeah. I love people really expanding what they're looking for when they're looking in the lists. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I also really, and I want to talk to you about as we move back to artistic conversation in terms of, you mentioned a few of your own inspirational composers, composers that really, um, you modeled yourself after, or just inspired you in craft or mu music. You know, I'm, I'm a big Mahler person coming as a, originally as a woodwind player. So John Williams, I connected with really, when you hear like, oh wait, that's just Mahler, right? <laughs> um, and yeah. Others, yeah. Like, yeah, that's the yeah. point. Um, being able to work with a lot of different, getting exposed early on will help you find your voice and your point of view. So I like people taking the shot of assisting for things that they don't necessarily think they're interested in because I believe it will help you open up and connect to things you don't even know that you're good at or that you yeah. have skills set at. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, a great example is I I needed a job in college. Here's, here's, here's an example. I needed a job in college to make some money. And um, I also was broke and I wanted clothes. So I worked at a retail place. That retail place was a commission-based thing, so I had to really do some sales. And what I what I thought about at the time, because there was nothing, you know, nothing ever talked about this at school. But one of the things I thought about is like, well, how it's not that much different from what I have to do, right? I've got a product that I've got to know. Granted, the product that I do now is myself and my, you know, my my right. image, my branding, my sound, whatever it is. But I had the experience on that job when I when I kind of really put it into perspective that I was. All everybody that came in was a nut was a pitch, but how can you come off not only genuine in your pitch, but you know uh, you know the product well enough, which is like music. You know I I know what I'm doing, um, and I really want to find what's best for you. So I I basically utilized that as a platform to keep practicing that skill set, which I didn't really realize until I was kind of in it that this is actually what I was getting out of it. Um, and then yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, it was like, you know, so I ended up doing more retail jobs just because of that, because I knew how to do it. But I also liked talking to people. I liked I liked the interaction, um, which was all part of my own personality, which, you know, I put into my own uh, skill set in making music and collaborating with filmmakers. But, you know, truly our job as composers and as storytellers and as, you know, musical voices for things, you know, we have to know a certain amount more about what filmmakers do and about the filmmaking process, then they're gonna have really necessarily know about ours. It's yeah. not, um, and dealing with personalities and learning how to, um, you know, read the room, understand what someone's trying to say when they really can't figure it out because people don't know how to really always speak in musical terms. And sometimes they try to, and then it's, it's not even, it's all wrong. Cause my version of when you say, you know, green or blue could be very different or plucky this or pluck, you know, or making noises, whatever it's going to be, or that's, what is that thing up there? That, that weird sound? Oh, that's an oboe. Oh, you know, like the, nobody knows. Sometimes they just don't have a clue. So you're really there. And I think, you, you know, you're John Williams is a great example of someone who's, you know, been able to express things to musicians in a way that I've never seen, but also, so how do you, you know, interpret? But he can also just talk layman. He also is able to work with directors who have no musical vocabulary at all. That's right. It's just a, it's a way, you know, it's a way of being able to just um, sit with somebody and make them feel comfortable. And at the same time, again, this whole job is that someone feels confident in me and will trust me enough with their project. So, um, you know, that's part of this job. That's part of the thing that I love, which is why, again, you can, you know, there are composers who might not be obviously John Williams that still have a great career because they're great people to work with. And they're great people to work with. I mean, innovative. yeah. One of the reasons I love working with you is you have the ab ability 
to bring amazing original ideas in a fearless way, even when there is a clarity from the artistry of the film, from the tone of the film, I can come in with a very specific vision for what I want, but you have a way of expanding options. You don't come in with an answer. You come in with the options. And then if I say, great, thanks for showing me that, but this is what I want, you're able to move through that. I think they're, composing is second to editing, the most important language that goes into the film itself. It is the spirit, it's the emotional component of the film. And the amount of work and art that goes into it, it can be a challenge when the music comes back from a composer and it just isn't right. Yeah. And um, it's, can you can have a lot of emotional connection to what you've created and written musically for film. And you can just believe emotionally, the emotional content of the scene that this is right. But at the end of the day, we are in service of that director, or more importantly, we're in service of the network. And mm -hmm. despite the director and the showrunner, if the network has a note, if HBO says, we don't like the cue, there's not any conversation. I think yeah. as we talk about your characteristics that made you really successful in this space, that to me, patience is huge because mm -hmm. you can spend a lot of time working really hard, like you said, long nights, and then in two seconds get something shot down you spend a lot of time on. And in the room, you can't share that frustration or disappointment or annoyance. Right. Uh, you can't let them know that you're feeling some kind of way about it. And <laughs> I think you're really yeah. right. And you also come with great ideas, but I think, and I want you to talk about as you build your team and the yeah. characteristics, how does somebody know they've got the personality of someone who's going to be really good in this space? What that is a great question. It's one of the first things I always ask them. I mean, sometimes I can tell that if someone has that leadership quality, they're probably going to be good at this whole thing. Because that really is, if you look at it from a different couple perspectives, um, this is the music business. So you have to have a business hat on. If you're running a team and you're putting together a team, you're basically this manager uh, and producer. And so you're doing all of these things, getting all of this together, making sure that everybody is under is on the same page, is getting treated well, whatever it might be. And that takes a lot of effort. And it takes a lot from a different perspective. Because I think as an artist, you know, if it's going to be my gig and I want to just do everything myself because I'm micromanaging whatever, people do that. And they work like crazy. Or the, And that usually is not a great way to do it. Obviously, in any setting of a business group, we get into this setting where I, I like to pick people personally who... Um, even if their skill set at at uh, you know the music side of things or the tech side isn't exactly there, but if they've got the the drive and the ambition and the will and again organizational stuff uh, to help my workflow and to help this thing this whole job go from a point A to point B, it's fantastic. If they can do all these other different things too, in terms of maybe they know how to sample, maybe they know how to take a sound and create new patches for me, maybe they're really good at cutting at music editing and uh or maybe they're just excellent at at coming in and helping me from a, like an emotional point you know like hey it's gonna be okay you know take a breath yeah. get up things like this literally those kinds of things are a all very helpful kind of way like a good producer yeah. yeah i mean we're a band one way or another we're all on the same same boat weekly doing the same things and um but a great experience a, a great thing is i had a i had a great assistant who i loved and uh still still to this day too but he uh everything he excelled at everything i could give him a, 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 a task check this out or can you you know can you work on this to help with my workflow can you find some libraries out there maybe that would be in the zone can you make you know whatever it might be he can figure it all out and then i wanted him to compose uh you know give him a shot to start writing and he didn't really want to do that as much he kind of either liked more of what he was doing in this other way or maybe he just wasn't confident and feeling enough that this was really what he wanted to do as a job as a um, composer as a composer and i think that's, that's so the valid part about it if you work for people or if in particular you work for a big composer you're going to see a lifestyle 
that you may or may not want. And Very specific. I think that, yeah, that's where it takes, like you were saying, a certain kind of personality to be able to do this. Yet I have friends who happy being orchestrators, happy being not and a person. It's an art form orchestration yeah. and it's celebrated. I think, in, especially in the feature film side, when you're really talking about film scoring, yeah. that orchestrator has so much um, artistic, they can be so much part of the creative process, although it doesn't seem like it's as a creative a job, but it's so critical. Oh, it's critical. I mean, in the film, you know, definitely in the film orchestral world, it's super critical. Um, those guys have multiple now. Now I think it's gone to the point to where they're, they're they do, um, between takedowns of composers who are writing in a sequencer Can and then you sending them. what a takedown is for everybody? Yeah, so it, like, like a takedown would be that if, if I sent you a bunch of audio and uh, you would have to be able to write this out uh, correctly for the instrument, for the instrumentalist to play it, yeah. but you don't have um, necessarily, a, you know, certain takedowns, you, you don't have the actual notes in front of you, so you're doing it that way. What we do a lot that is like that, transcribing. It's like almost. transcribing, but because yeah. we, now we have MIDI, which is the language, the computer language that we write all of our. You know, if if you ever have used a sequencer at all, you'll see each instrument line, and it'll have its little dashes and lines that show what you've played into the keyboard. When you do that. That then take, you know, you give it to the orchestrator. Now that orchestrator has to interpret all of that into the live orchestra or into whatever group you're doing. Again, it's a skill set. It's an art form, like you said, to be able to take somebody that I was doing that for Snuffy all the time, too. How do you take something from somebody's mind and they might just be playing 10 finger chords, but you got to actually make it work for the orchestra or make it, it work, work for them? You get to know you get to know their favorite chordal progressions yeah. that, oh, he really meant E flat here, even though he might've just put in the third and the fifth, that's right? right. <laughs> but you, so many, uh, you get is, to know their language. You can That's that great it. shorthand that you'll end up having with your team. So when I pick my team, uh, the beauty of it, like for example, uh, on All Rise, I ended up uh, getting a couple other writers um, who are, were fantastic uh, and, it, it was a uh, it, it was a young both young composers, but you know one was a Colombian gentleman, one was a uh, she was like part Filipino for something. She was and they were amazing. They were smart. They were uh, they were they were talented. They they listened. They were uh, totally part of the team. Totally wanted to kind of get on. You know, understood the show, understood what it needed, and um, but came from two like really cool perspectives. You know, really different cultural backgrounds, different cultural perspectives, and different. Uh, really everything. I'm sure it's like that, right? Because the undercurrent of that show yeah. is is a breakthrough. Somebody breaking through kind of barriers exactly. to entry as a black person, as a woman in a in a career that didn't have many of both. Having that represented from the music voice is really cool. Yeah, that you created that opportunity. In anything, I mean, having diversity in anything is amazing. I mean, I, I love working on projects like that, mainly just because, I, I mean, I watch so many more foreign films sometimes too, just because the, the voices are different. The, right. the, the vibe is, uh, you know, it feels, it just there's a different feeling that I just really relate to. Um, and, uh, and having a team like that is great. I mean, it's like anything. You have a, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, people, you know, from different ethnicities, whatever it might be, everybody's experience Kind of comes into this amazing team of people that I think creates a lot more options than any other way. Truly, it's like you know you can get the same kind of personality that comes from a school or whatever it might be, but then you can also get someone who doesn't. I mean, there's music and there's people who love this stuff everywhere. It's just a matter of you know how it can they get a chance? Will they be introduced to things early on enough to know that it even exists? And yeah. then will they be able to kind of continue their career? You know. Because they, you have to financially try to get through the music business, and it's not easy. And survive it. Surviving the music and business is tough. Surviving yeah. the music business. Yeah. So, I want to talk a little bit about back to creative process. Mm -hmm. What's your job when you first get hired? Um, I love how you talked about how you got hired, right? And the ways that you approach it like a job, and how you're presenting yourself to demonstrate and to talk about yourself and your ability to get the job. So now that you've got the job and feature works a little bit different in TV. So 
um, let's start with television. What's the job? What is the first thing you do? Second thing you do? Third thing you do? How do you approach a conversation? Are you in the tone meeting? Um, how do you kind of execute figuring out artistically when you have a pre can show that already has their bumpers and their cues and their kind of flavor? What's your job when you get hired on an episode? And then we'll talk about feature. Great question. Okay, so um, some depending on if it's a if it's a TV show or a, a, a filmmaker that I've worked with before, sometimes they get me involved way earlier, which is really fun for me because I can get in on script phase. I can maybe go before we shoot anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's really exciting uh, for me just because I personally like it. But um, half That's the time, not realistic in TV. No. No, generally I'm I'm I come in way towards the end, um, and what they've done already to the show generally is what we call temp. Uh, they use temp music, so that means music from other scores or other TV shows. They've already cut in as an example of what kind of what they're looking for. So um, it may not be my music; it may be my music. I, I don't know. It just depends on the job. And then and in that spotting session, tell us who's in that spotting session. People might be surprised the director's not always there. Correct. And the TV thing in particular, directors are almost never there unless they are either a producer uh, on the show or the showrunner. Because I, on All Rise, one of my showrunners was also a director on the show. And unless um, you're James Gunn, right? Who does yeah. everything himself. Right? right. It really is a producer's medium on television. And uh, so that's really who I'm dealing with. I'm, and I'll usually have the showrunner, who is the person who is the producer designated. To pretty much run post and you know production to a certain extent depends on how involved they want to be i guess on all of these things but um there has to be a point person for me for music for post there has to be somebody who's looking at all of it and and okaying things and approving this and approving that um and it generally is the showrunner who may most of the time be the creator so i'm usually in there and i've got my music editor which is a, another integral job in television that uh, people I don't believe also give enough respect to. It is a very difficult job, and half the time they're on the pilot, that you know, or any of the series before I'm on it because they're usually the ones sometimes even temping in all the music. So they already have a kind of an upper hand, knowing what the personalities are, what the problems are, what the good things are, all that stuff. So they become a great asset and help to me. And that's they have, a great job. Career. Yeah. And they have a Career whole other set of editing. skill sets that they have to do. Program wise. Music is an assistant job, but the music editor job is one of the most powerful positions in post and leads creative. Super creative. Uh, a lot of stress and on these guys, you know, they are the usually are uh, the middle person between myself and the producers. So in the same way, uh, a co-producer or, you know, on the show or another one might be my producer version between the execs in the studio my music editor is my champion on the on the on the dub stage when they're when they're mixing to anything so it's just another person in your you know on your side on your team that is um you know has your best interest and the and the show's music best interest you know and and can also if they're really good can give you great insight as well you might be like oh you know why isn't this working they're saying well because a lot of them are composers who've also become music editors or who didn't want to go down the composing thing, but there's, but they have that same good sense. Um, and I, I found them integral and extremely helpful. I think it's a very underrated job. Uh, and I, I really feel like, um, you know, I, I wish that they could get more credit than they already do because they, a lot of them do a lot of hard work. Um, but that's who I'm in this, the, that meeting with. After that, uh, the music editor creates, uh, of all the notes we talked about, uh, the music editor will create a set of what we call spotting notes. And the spotting notes are each cue in order with the time codes that it's coming in, you know, wh where it's in and out, and uh, usually a title. Um, any of the info that we talked about in the meeting is in there. For, so I have a complete and list. We call that a spotting session in production. Yes, spotting yes. session then produces spot. spotting notes. Spot. Right, yes. that comes out of the spotting session. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and those notes are like my, my, my Bible. So I basically look at that and I can begin to now, cause it also has, uh, you know, the, the time like of each cue. So you can see the total amount of music you have, how many cues are we also call starts, how many starts you're going to have 
in, uh, in, in, in an episode. And okay, now I can kind of, in a sense, work backwards. Like I'll know, you know, it, 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 it informs me how much work I'm going to have to do between the time that I just got out of the meeting to delivery day. So, um, that is what this document represents from that point. We then begin the pro the actually the fun part, which is the writing part. Now, like you said, if it's a show that I just got on uh, that has no tone, I have to figure out with the showrunner what that tone, what that musical voice, what the sound of the show is going to be, um, which is exciting and the, the best part. So once that is there, it takes about, I'd say, a good three to four episodes before I can really kind of understand where I'm at with the show. Then they also have um, existing music that's created for the show to be able to temp into subsequent right. episodes. So it right. becomes a lot more, the show starts to find its sound because they're reusing cues now that are also originally written for the show. And then the show starts to real. So as even as the studio execs see it and the network sees it, they start to get an idea now really of how this show is gonna kind of go down. Um, so it takes time. And that's kind of the thing about all of this is that all of this takes time to do, but we're very much in like, you know, from the time I'm spotting to my dub is all is almost about a week or it could be less depending on the show. So within that in time, a show like that with those kind of turnaround times, what's the, what's the reality of being able to work with live musicians or are you finding that with the tighter timelines, you're having to do a lot more digital creation? Yeah, so depending on the, the type of music that's in the show, um, I'll give you two examples. Uh, when I was on The Middle, um, it was uh, me r me playing guitars and, and programming everything uh, as a preview for my showrunner. When she approved it, I finally was able to get a session with one guitar player who would come in and replace my bad guitar playing for all of his good guitar playing. And... Um, I would have a day session with him, and then I would give it to my engineer to mix, who, by the way, is another integral part of this whole process. Um, and uh, then we give it to the music editor, who then cuts it into the session and takes it to the final mix. Uh, but that's the way I am not the type of composer who generally has people listening to stuff on the dub stage. Um, I like to be able to give out previews okay. to my, my showrunner uh, early you know, and have them listen to it. So by the time we get to the stage, he or she has already heard it all and approved it. And if they have changes in, in feelings, then we can deal with that when it comes. You're not behind the eight ball per se. Right. That's really exactly. helpful. Let's talk a yeah. little bit about that. So I, you know, um, I encourage everybody to go back to your favorite shows and listen, watch, listen to the music of the first four to six episodes and you start to see, and look at who's working on it. You can tell when somebody has been brought in for the pilot episode who didn't catch the tone of the show. Maybe the network wanted to change the direction of the show. And sometimes you'll notice that the music team has changed or that the music team has really shifted gears. So by the time you get to episode five or six, you really can see what that film music is for that show it really starts to bake in those first like three. I think it takes like three to four. Yeah, it takes a little bit to get in the writer's room. Right. It, yeah. It's like a cake baking, right? Exactly. And you can really tell when a show's not working. One of the first things they do is look at if it's too comedic or if it's too dramatic. Yeah. Well, if we lift the music, will it change the spirit of the show and make it lighter or make it more? Correct gravity yeah so um, yeah and a lot of stuff what we deal with um it, it, especially in television is a mixture of people who want a lot of music and mm. who don't want barely anything so mm. you'll get this mix of people who love their 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 dialogue and that's what they really want to only hear and then they're like all right yeah music's there too i guess i got it. so the personalities are, span the whole thing um, personal yeah everybody's music. personal taste and working with someone who, for example, a showrunner or creator who doesn't want a lot of music, and then you deal with a studio that's going, hey, these scenes are really dry. And then yeah. there's this tension between trying to figure out how to balance that out. And so I tried, that's a huge job of mine now to come in and say, okay, well, let's see if we can find a, a middle point for both so everybody can kind of be happy. Yeah, and it, of course, has to serve 
the picture, no matter what, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think in, um, so how is the artistic process different in, uh, we'll talk about the video game world, but let's talk about film, film music and film scoring, yeah. because I think the approach, I think that what I call the pregame is so much different. Um, I know going into, I know I'm going to ask my composer for a feature film to create music that I'm probably going to use maybe 50 to 60% of. And we all know that going in. <laughs> uh, I, I, I like to feel like I'm going to mood and I'm yeah. getting velvet and I'm getting taffeta and I'm getting, I don't want to go in and just get kind of three yards of one kind of music. By the time I get into my sound mix, I want to have it all accessible to me so that my mm -hmm. sound editor and my sound design team can f choose from it what we need. I don't know that all composers are work well that way. I think there's kind of three different ways to work. So talk about mm -hmm. what works for you and um, what kind of situations you like to collaborate in. Um, since I have most, I, I've I've composed mostly for indie films um, that don't have studios attached to it. So I don't have to, the, the, the beauty of being able to just do what we want um, without anybody barking, you know, on the other side there has been lovely. I, I think a majority of my films and even my short films are things that I can be creative on and have a voice in much differently than everything else where I have to think of every other aspect of it half the time um, to make sure that we're, you know, that we're doing the right thing. On this, we can take those risks that they don't allow. And so uh, the film process is, and some filmmakers I work with don't put any temp in at all. And, and that means that the movie is silent for the most part, or if they have at least one track they kind of like and they'll put it in, but they come to me and they go, I know it needs music in other places, but I just don't know what that exactly is. Um, Plus, I feel like that's your, your art. That's what that's the superpower you bring to the table. I don't want to precondition you to what I think the beats are. I find it really informative as a storyteller yeah. for you to hear what the composer had to say unencumbered by my preconceived notions. Sometimes I'm limited and I can't mm. see great opportunity around the corner. I love delivering a cut that has no temp sound. That's great. I, it's not everybody does that. I mean, I think the fear of people is I can't see this movie without this, this, uh, some sort of music. Um, and maybe it's because the movie isn't as strong too. Like, you know, you have to have enough confidence in your acting or in your actors, in your filmmaking. You know, we can come in as band-aids music, right? We can clean up areas where, well, there's some all trouble there. But, of bad performance. Yeah, right? So we do all kinds of different things, but truly um, that creative juice in those moments are really what get me excited. And if they, if I can work with somebody that is open to be able to, you know, maybe, and I'm, I'm all about it. I'll try all kinds of different things. I don't mind, but if something is, if I'm really specific about something, I'm really there, generally they'll be with me on it and we'll, we'll go there. But I always make sure that I'm, because, because this is such a tunnel vision job that the, the, the best part about having great collaborators who can, who are, you know, good note givers, really into the emotion, understand the characters obviously well enough, but also a team of people around you that can help you in that setting. Um, I can get out of my tunnel vision, right? I, I can, I'm not doing all the jobs myself. I can sit there and I can write this cue and I might have some you know, assistant here, or I might ask a musician buddy, hey, you know, can you take a look at this? And just, I'm just too caught up, you know? It's, yeah. it's the same thing. It's like having your, your spouse come in or your girlfriend or boyfriend come in and yeah. take a listen. You know, if you're a regular movie goer, how does this feel for you? You know, I, I always take value in all of it because everybody's first reactions are the things you're looking at. They've never heard it before. And then they're seeing, they're, they're connecting the emotion now for the first time. You see, they might rewatch it two or three other times and now they have a new opinion about it. But that first moment is very, uh, very important just to kind of see how it's actually really going off. And then we kind of tighten it up from there. But um, the beauty is just having people who, who have enough sense and enough uh, integrity themselves to be able to afford you that opportunity to take that chance. And if it doesn't work, they don't go, this is shit, you're fired. They, they go, hey, okay, I see what you're saying. Or maybe they find something within it 
but then they're like, I, I think I need something more. And then usually it, it, it's just building your own experience as a composer of writing to picture and what that does, because there really is an art form to be a it's composer to, to picture as opposed to just a composer or just a writer where you can do your own thing. Um, like you said, you're, you're in a limited, it's a param, it's like a parameter, you know, parameter of all of these things that you have to basically work with in this perimeter. This is what I have. This is my limited kind of setting, but I can still go beyond that limitation, you know, energy wise and all these kinds of things, but it's still a certain medium that you have to be able to fit, <laughs> you know? It's true because there's so much pressure by the time the film gets to you, the film's over budget, the film's running long things that happened, you guys are always paying the price for mistakes that happen on set in production. Mm. Um, and many times I think filmmakers come in with unrealistic windows about how much time it takes to do the composing. Right. I also feel sometimes they let the composer start too early when the edit hasn't really found its own voice. So you'll yes. end up composing to a show that changes significantly and then that work's got to be done again and chances are the filmmaker doesn't have the money for that can you talk about the kind of questions that young composers when we start out looking for our first gigs you want to say yes to everything because everything could be that opportunity yeah. when are the situations what should people be asking looking for red flags of when a gig is not a good opportunity do you have any specific questions people should be asking, scenarios that seem fishy? Yeah. Do you ask for half the money up front? How do you navigate uh, knowing that I'm safe? Yeah. Feeling like, oh, this is a show where I'm not going to get paid and does that matter to me? Is this something that's going to be good for my reel? Can you yeah. talk a little bit about the personal side of, of this and starting right. out when you don't know any different? It's a, it's a great, great question. Great point. Um, there, there's a few things I, I, that I would, I would look at. Um, first of all, the opportunity that we have to be able to research everybody and every, you know, if a project comes around, you can go online and try to find out all kinds of information. You can begin to then find those filmmakers or find those people make different kind of connections as to where perhaps they may really be at versus where they may say they're at. Um, but truly, my whole thing going into it is, is if you're a young composer, you're starting your career out, what, you know, you always would love to be in a circle of the most talented people you could find. You want to be the most lower end of that incredible group of people so that you can begin to rise. We're at, now, that doesn't always come. Sometimes it does. You know, there is luck involved in who we're meeting. If, but if you're in the mix one way or another, just doing things you're going to have opportunities to kind of get that thing but having understanding what the con future connections of this particular project might serve you for example um this particular producer has worked on other films or with other artists or with other people that you kind of like um, yeah. and you can see that their trajectory might be kind of going up fantastic um this particular movie already has distribution that could be kind of cool too you know perhaps it's going to get out before as opposed to sitting around or go to a film festival maybe never sell um or uh you just you know you're just getting in there you're having that discussion and you're just vibing and you're like i just really dig these people and i'd like to give this a shot your time is worth everything right the time that i'm going to give to this project is now going to cut into my financial life, depending on what I'm doing, to my personal life with my family. So I want to make sure that my time is valuable enough to be and worthwhile to work with people I really want to work with. It's just going to be a matter of how you find that. I mean, some people, you might be able to do their short film and you go off and you do their feature and they have this incredible career. Unfortunately for composers uh, in this medium, we are beholden to how well a particular filmmaker is going to do. I mean, if they don't get a job, you don't get a job. Or if you really love working with somebody, but then they just decide to quit the business, you know, but you're never going to really know that. So all you can do is go into it saying, how can I, you know, what co other connections can I get from this? Will I able to, will I maybe get some loyalty and they'll do well and go further? The other thing is, like you said, the money side, you know, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have any money. I'm sorry, this and that, you know, we get that all the time as music. Um, 
there are going to be things that I think as composers we need to do for free. It's just no other way out of this. I think there are going to be some jobs. Generally, save those for the bigger jobs, if anything, but try never to do anything. So even when I did short films, I would say, um, you know, if they can't find the money to pay me and do the live thing, I would I would work out another deal to say, pay for the live stuff and all of the other people that I got, and then my fee will be different. Or I'll take I'll take a, a part of the, uh, you know, the film uh, producing credits. There's different things that you can do to try to get yourself in that zone compensated. But truthfully, you know that a lot of these are just labors of love that people are doing, and they may or may hit or they may not. So give those types of jobs, which come around probably easier than obviously getting onto big studio stuff, um, thoughts, very careful thought as to how that can work for you in the future. You own the music protection, meaning that you, if, you, know, you can usually cut a deal where you can own the rights to the music. So they have exclusive rights to use it for the film, but then you own the master. So now you've got this great selection of music, which by the way, they pay for because I had them do a live, you know, group. So now I've got this great music that I own with live recording that is part of my own personal library now. So that's kind of how I would treat some of these smaller projects where they really couldn't pay me. Um, but yeah, you know, there is no particular going rate. We're in a, you know, that's why composers have agents. Every deal is different. Um, you kind of know there is a kind of a going rate, but it's not really the same for everybody. And who knows if really they're telling the truth. So it's like, it could be all over the place in that zone. So I would just say that make sure that you feel like you're getting compensated well enough that you're not going to, you know, have to kill yourself on this thing, but that there's some sort of benefit down the line, whether it's, um, you know, like I said, a connection to something in the future or that you have ownership in something in particular. I think those are the only ways that we can protect ourselves because outside of that, it's just, you know, we're work for hire. We're, we're gigs. It's a, it's a gig market. I and someone will undercut you. <laughs> you know? question. And chances yeah. are you're not going to do a good job. I, I, I like problem, to yeah. tell people to, to know your truth as well. It, yeah. the, like you said, this is the best time ever because you can look at somebody, the social media, the digital footprint of someone is so, it's so easy to get in touch and also find out what they've worked on and reach out to somebody they've worked with before. Exactly. Yeah. I take the time, even if you're just starting out, you have the right to ask questions. You have, yeah, and, and to talk to people that work with that person before, if they don't have a lot of credits that you can go back and see, oh, they make stuff I really dig, they have a sensibility that I really want to play with, um, go find out who they went to school with, who's on their Facebook page, who do you know, what kind of person is this? Are they going to yeah. treat me with dignity and respect? Are they going to honor my time? I don't, I don't want to work with somebody who's going to be texting me at three in the morning, especially on a job that's not paying a lot. And I think yep. even when you're starting out, understanding how you're supposed to be treated yes. is, is really important and getting references and taking the time yeah. and, and making sure you're protecting yourself, both physically and emotionally. It's really yes. Important in in when you're starting out, because you're going to be working with a lot of filmmakers who are starting out. who are just learning the right protocol right. and what's acceptable behavior or not, and the sense of desperation that can come around a filmmaker that's put their last three thousand dollars into something and the stakes feel so high to them that sometimes that behavior can uh, not be appropriate to their post team, which always gets the short end of the stick anyway, and it's okay to get to reach out reach out email somebody who does this is their day job have yeah. those men and i want to talk about mentorship which is kind of the next step do you have any yeah. other thoughts or notes on um red flags or safety issues i was just going to say uh you, you said it so well in terms of I, I i love how you put all of that um one thing that's difficult at least it was for me uh is learn i mean this is again getting back to some sort of mental stuff boundaries right i mean you have to be able to protect yourself to a certain degree no matter what you know the the whole thing is you got to say yes you got to do everything you got to be there for everybody you got to answer every phone call whatever it might be at some point for your own mental health you have to have these boundaries and 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 lock them in place 
my the fear I had was like, if I don't do this, am I going to get fired? If I, you know, like I would run on that kind of fear, um, which is awful. And it was very hard emotionally to it's kind of always get creative. Creativity, it's you terrible. can't create it with that. Yeah. You're you're having to constantly compartmentalize and work, put things in different places. But you know, I know other guys that were able to really say, hey, this is what I'm doing. Uh, you know, I, I gotta teach my kid, you know, I I'm a coach on the baseball team. Sorry, I can't do it. And people, if if they really want to work with you and they respect you in that sense, it won't matter. And but it takes a long time for me, it took a long time for me to learn that that, that was feeling okay. But you, I think as a young person today, you got to go in with those type of, you got to have, you know, pretty yeah. good boundaries to understand that, but you have to as well be vulnerable enough to take those risks to learn. Sure. But um, yes, yeah, you, you know, I think you said it, you said it great. Um, you know, finding people who can treat you well, but you have to have your own self-protection up as well. Make sure. Yeah. You know. I love that. That's really important. So I want to overview at the end of the day, many people who find careers in the music sector are gonna be um, moving towards different guilds and unions that cover mm -hmm. the space. But what's really interesting is that they're also protection organizations um, because musicians have a different kind of licensing that not all the other unions for below the line have. So, mm -hmm. um, Many people think that BMI and ASCAP, which are the organizations that protect and do the business stuff for songwriters, they don't understand, they don't know that composers and many of the uh, original music and film scoring is also covered by BMI and ASCAP because that's licensable music. So can you talk about, and also the, um, uh, for lyricists and composers, this the guild for lyricists and composers. To, uh, you know, are you a member of that? Do you think that's oh, oh the SCL, the Society of Composers and Lyricists? Yep. Can you give us your impact? Your how did you pick between ASCAP and BMI? When did you? I think they both have amazing resources. That starting out, you need to start attending their events, going and understanding what it's going to take what's the list of things in the check list to get ready so that you can join when the time is right and they have so many great onboarding uh, um, events and seminars and conversations and one of the biggest decisions somebody can make is ASCAP and BMI for 35 years I've been in this business people always ask what the difference is and I've never heard one answer that that matters, right? That's yeah. that different between them. So I'd love to get your thoughts on the issue. Sure. Um, I, from TV and media, video game people. Say it again. One more Specifically for people filming TV and video games. Right. So uh, I joined BMI early on. Um, my 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 grandfather was a huge part of BMI, and and you know I've had my cousins have been on both sides. Uh, of things, and even that, there's the third one called CSAC. Um, there's that's a, you know, so you really have these three big choices here in the US. Um, I found that uh, the best way to pick your choice with these three, um, or even the big two, really comes down to how, what your connection is to your representatives there. They both do ultimately the same thing. So I would say that you're not going to necessarily get more money from one than the other because you're a songwriter or composer. It's it really is a matter of they have your, these rep these representatives there. They are the key for you to find out information, um, any kind of help, advice, which they are great at doing too. But really, to make sure that they have your back. And I feel like. Um, People kind of go off and on about like, well, this time, but if you're this kind of writer or if you do this kind of thing that BMI will do better. And I feel like it all kind of just comes, it's, you know, sometimes that BMI is higher than sometimes ask. It's just this all day long. So find out who you really connect with at these places and then then choose it that way. They'll both protect you great, I feel. Um, and and I felt like in the end, uh, after I was at BMI for a while, I I didn't feel like I was getting the type of attention. I didn't like the vibe as much as I did before. And so I switched and uh, I switched to ASCAP, which is where I am now. And uh, I do enjoy my my reps there. And 
you know, I think it is a difficult job that these these people have to try to, you know, especially in today where streaming is now becoming the main thing. Hurting cats for no money. It is much different. There's a lot of people, you know, who now come in straight into the streaming world and don't understand why their royalties are like Spotify, or, you know, awful. Just and and it's it's a it's a there is a mechanic behind it and there is a like mathematical kind of setting. But the bottom line is is that uh, you know ad ad based network based royalties versus you know streaming is just completely different. It's just the way it is now. There's software companies with barely any ads, the, all this kind of thing, but now they're turning into these larger real studios in, in a way like the old traditional kind. And now everybody's bumping to try to get them to, under, to take on the same kind of thing we were doing before. So it's going to be a long fight, no doubt, but it is changing. So, you know, that is something to consider. And the beauty about these organizations like the SCL, or um, you know, or your ASCAP and BMI is like you said. They offer um, insight. They offer programs. They offer workshops. Like I said, I was in the conducting one. ASCAP offers that big uh, film yeah. scoring workshop where you can you know get an opportunity to possibly. I mean, I've never that one has produced not only incredible composers, but it's it's really amazing to to get that opportunity. Um, and uh, and then you know the SCL is constantly out there having all of these seminars, all of these these um, these different so kinds of education. Yeah, and lecture, and again, people who could probably, you know, can explain things, help you. Um, and uh, I would say those, you know, those are great places to start to get information. You could, um, and then once you start doing things, you might be able to join like the TV Academy or whatever, and then you can get another kind of set with those governors and what that world is like. But truly, uh, these are great places to start to get off. But you got to remember that much like agents, when you're first starting out, you're doing the groundwork ultimately yourself yeah. for all of this stuff. There's no silver bullet. There's no magic potion. No one's going to get uh, an agent and work. Yeah, they're not. ASCAP isn't going to, you know, save you. And uh, you have to basically know that, you know, they're going to do the best they can. And mm -hmm. it might not all, you know, you, it, it, you might go, I get no response from these people. Then maybe you move on. It's that's totally cool. You know what I mean? That's just what we do. But you got to make sure that you're happy where you are, recognizing, you know, the reality of what we're in too. You know, it's so helpful. And there's so many um, breadcrumbs online that will start you out with the resource guide when you guys get them, uh, and you'll be able to. Just, there's a lot of conversation around these organizations, and they're very open. So um, take the time to invest the time to really explore all these websites attend the great thing about right now a lot of stuff is still virtual so yeah. there's a lot of public accessibility yeah. um and so as we start to turn the corner we're going to ask just a couple more questions and wrap this up True. um i want to talk about one is logistic a lot of composers um end up making a good amount of revenue on their library mm -hmm. but building your own library and being in the library business um, which works really well for, I think, songwriters. That's been a, a really good bridge for songwriters to come in because they had a body of work and then they do more composing and having com composition libraries. But there's a lot of admin, a lot of uptake, a web. You got to have a great webmaster. There's a real investment. Mm -hmm. um, and there are so many music libraries already out there. Does it make sense for an individual composer that's early level to mid level to make? to think about that world, the library world. Um, and, you know, just any insight? I know I get this question a lot of, should I be building my own library? I find a lot of composers spend more time doing that than networking and meeting directors to collaborate with. Um, and if they don't have a huge body of work already, that they can spend a lot of money for little transaction until they get to a certain amount of networking. It's just all networking, right? So can yeah. you give us an insight of your just what's your personal thoughts about it? Yeah. Um my my personal thoughts there is that, you know, I don't know the like how these music libraries, these bigger ones might pay for people who are kind of staff folks working there and what it's ultimately like. Um it doesn't seem to probably be the best for everybody. I think it's, you know, it's probably a lot of hard work and probably not, you know, a big amount of money. But um to develop your own library and to run that, yeah, that's a whole 
completely a whole other world. I would imagine you have to be very much in that zone of not only being the composer who's going to dedicate all their time to doing work in that zone, whether it's reality shows, whatever, and then build this incredible, you know, this catalog of music and either sell it off to a larger one or become your little boutique thing. But like you said, you have to, you have to get all the infrastructure to run that. So, um, the one thing that's interesting about that to me is that I do believe that libraries are going to be around a while. I think that productions still love to use it in one way or another. So it's not going to go away. Uh, I think that, um, you probably would, you know, if you're going to write for that, you know, hone those skills, learn that stuff, but remember to ultimately exit. I think if you really want to continue to be more prolific, that's not going to be the place for you to kind of do that. If you have, um, but if that's your goal is to create a library company, then I would say, you know, go in hardcore, but go in probably with some folks who really know how to do that so that you can get the infrastructure part there and then work on the creative. But I mean, that's a whole other world that I just don't have enough experience in, except for the fact that I did, when I was doing this reality show called Little People Big World, I did end up in a sense building a library of my own music for that. But that was all, you know, discovery owned. So it's it's just kind of one of those things where I, did, I didn't even know how to do a library for myself or how to farm out to anybody else or whatever at that time. So I was just writing, 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 writing but it ended up creating its own kind of library. So I kind of went, okay, but that was again, designed for that show. We're talking- Except that you know you're gonna get that license deal. Yes, but we're talking, like sense. you said, yeah. writing music for anything that can get into any show, any pro any any production, one way or another. Um, yeah, I mean, that could be, you know, uh, again, you, maybe you have a couple friends that just have a lot of music and you guys are gonna merge and say, let's do this, or, you know. And what if you have a lot of IT skill? And, yeah. and can put a WordPress together and yeah. really understands how to code the back end, then you have the resources in house to do it. Correct. To yes. outsource that stuff can be really expensive for, and one of the things I think um, friends of mine that have done libraries over the years learned is uh, when, especially when you're doing syndicated shows like an Entertainment Tonight, you're delivering yeah. library for them, you, it could take 120 days to six months to get paid. And so a lot of people don't understand the cash flow challenges um, and that it's a really long lead time before you actually get your revenue in. And a lot of people haven't budgeted for that. And that can be problematic as well. Definitely. You got to get on some sort of stream. You know, that's, that's the thing about having projects that keep going. And so by the time you're getting paid and now it's just kind of a, you know, yeah. it's all working itself out. Yeah, it, it's it's a, it's a whole other world, doable for sure. If you have those type of skill sets and you want to go down that thing, and you might have a really cool idea, like I got a really cool sound, or you know, I want to make a library of this kind of stuff, or maybe you want to make a library of samples. Maybe you are an instrumentalist that wants to create a library uh, of you know airhu samples or you know whatever, and you want you know you want to go into that world. That's also a whole other world of 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 working that kind of stuff out. Um, and, and also, I think beneficial, a lot of musicians, for example, who might be players and they're off tour and they're kind of well known, they might make a little library and sell it off. Right. You know, anybody can do, you know, th that's Love kind that. of something. And a lot of that um, people from Beck all the way through also have provided for their own branding purposes. And you can go to a lot of open source websites that where people are mm. sharing music for this different kind of licenses under open source and CCL, where some people it makes sense to give a couple samples, maybe they'll do five or 10 pieces that represent just because they want to get their name out and hopefully get their stuff placed for free, yeah. just to generate some new creative contact and context. So think about ways that those marketing opportunities can help you build developing and hopefully getting more directors to and music uh, supervisors also are really important community people to learn about, read about on yeah. those shows that you love, on the films where there are composers who are making music you love. And these are people that you maybe think you want to intern apprentice or production assist for. Look at who the music supervisors are and the post-production supervisors, because many times they're actually the ones that are bringing in that entry-level talent. And many people are emailing the composers directly who aren't necessarily in charge of who's coming in. 
uh, and that line. And that's so, a great point. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about opinion. that when you were talking about that, the one thing we hadn't touched upon was music supervisors. And I do feel like, um, I, I've had people say like, Hey, I really am really into that kind of thing. And I'm like, okay, so are you, you know, do you love live music? Do you, can you, are you interested in like lots of bands? Can you go? Oh yeah. Like I love to, but then the, the side of that is clearance. So there's a whole other business side to that job too. Yeah. And so somebody who comes in seminar that we did that's available on YouTube on oh, our cool. LA County library. So we a couple months ago did a great music supervisor session like this. Fantastic. So yeah. And that might be interested. Um, Joey, you're exactly right. It's a huge on ramp for a lot of people specifically yeah. coming from performing music. I thought it was going to be a music supervisor. One of my first gigs I got through music supervision because I was a musician. So, yeah. um, uh, yeah so yeah and understanding the line between that composers you know we generally don't handle in our deals what what we call source music which is the songs on the radio and yeah that's generally is handled by that department so again two different kinds of things but that always merge together somehow <laughs> you know and then music editor keeps everybody kind of speaking to each other and translating Correct. yeah that middle person um stakeholders i want to call yeah that can i'll be kind of fighting for territory to get more of their stuff in right so that's correct yeah. the last thing i want to kind of land on is the spirit of internship apprenticeship um as we are talking about what kind of characteristics as you're determining yourself and the life you want to have um and what might make you in addition to your interest or ability in music to be really good at jobs in this sector it's really important um, to find the right mentors. And that mentor could be like you, Joey, you got so blessed to find and the, a composer that was working in a space who really became your mentor. And so when you are looking for people to mentor, which you do a lot of, what should young people or people who are transitioning from another Maybe somebody who's been a touring musician for a long time, they want to be home, COVID's changed their life, and they want to maybe get into something that's, that makes more sense for their lifestyle. How, what are the characteristics I should be looking for? Um, somebody having a famous name as a composer isn't how you choose a mentor. Right. What is? Yeah. I, I guess, um, one place to start is to certainly, uh, if you if you can say to yourself, I really love writing this kind of music. I'm kind of into this. My favorite show, my favorite, you know, composers might be these people. Um, but yet, you know, can I get in touch with them or not? Like you said, is can the famous, you know, it's not always the best thing. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to search those kinds of folks out necessarily like the other ones the characteristics more but important the char yeah the characteristics of what i would look for at in a mentor what is you, what did the mentor do for you it, the the best thing to do in, in my book and what it did for me was um someone who can see you uh see you as a as a person see you as a peer as a colleague not as uh, somebody who's below you, you know, who's below them, that's going to just, you know, take advantage of them, all these kinds of things. You really want to find at least somebody who respects that, that boundary and that particular setting and this art form. So you can meet composers who are, are in it for the money. You can meet composers who are in it for the art. You can meet yeah. people who are in the middle, you know, and I, I think that uh, what I, what I always try to offer up and hopefully you can find, you know, things like this is, is, you want to find somebody who will definitely um, not only champion you, but will really open up this world to you and take the time to educate. I think that's one of the things that, you know, mentors take the time to sit and really listen to what you're saying and then offer advice, but don't tell you what to do per se. Because that's the thing. It's like, I can't tell this composer, do this, do that, do this and do that, and you're going to be fine because everybody's path is completely different. But I can say, you know, here's not here's what happened to me. Here's kind of what's going on now. What do you, you know, what's your take? What do you think? And do you feel um, 
that your personality could handle these kinds of things. You know, I, I ask questions like that to people, but I really want to be able to make sure that um, that the longevity of this career is the hardest part because music is so difficult to stay in financially and it's, it's an emotional business and all this kind of thing too, that, you know, do you have enough in within yourself to really where, you know, you got to have a little, you got to have the thick skin, but you also have to be vulnerable and you want, so there's lots of elements that you have to do. So when you look for a mentor, someone who can kind of see all of that would be great because again, you don't want to just get somebody who only talks music all the time and has no worldly sense or like, you know, you can only get so much information on gear and so much information on the tech side of it, but you want a whole person as a mentor and, and somebody, you know, who you can really go in there and say, I really respect this person for who they are. Now they might not, you know, you might not agree on all everything, but ultimately you respect them and they got your interests at, at heart and they really are interested in, in showing you and, you know, not only what they do, but educating you to be the future of this. That's, you know, that, that's what we're doing here because if I don't do it and my buddies don't do it, who's gonna do it? You know, this, this, these schools will get you out there, but the schools don't have the opportunity to really kind of dig into real life. That's just, yeah. that's why alums go back and talk. But, you know, I, I, so characteristics of integrity, um, you know, uh, genuine, as authentic as you can find, I guess, in, in that personality, but someone who really is going to take you on and educate you about this business. You know, I try to take people to sessions or I'll try to, I want them to get a real big picture of what it looks like, but also, you know, respect the fact that, you know, this is not an easy job, that this is, you know, it takes time. It's there, it's, it, you got to learn, you have to, you do have to pay dues to a certain extent just to get through it. Um, it doesn't happen overnight all the time, you know, but if you have the skills ready to go in the right, you know, like when that door opens, you can at least start to jump in and feel good about it. And that's, you know, to me, that's the kind of mentors that I like and the ones that I looked for when I was doing this too is and but truly you're going to find everybody's vibe, every, every, any yeah. person you might work for or intern for, you're going to take all of those little pieces and put it together to make your own. I love that. And it's such a perfect, um, set of things to think about as we wrap up. Um, thank you so much for that thoughtfulness. I, I love that the music part of this business is the single most, it's a single thread that unites us all. Mm -hmm. um, I don't care what background anybody comes from, but um, the best of resources, foster care, incarceration, challenges, economic, I mean, people that come from very few resources to people who get to go to the top level art schools or even go to an arts high school. Some of you are coming and you're not going to LOXAS. Some of you don't go to BH High. Some of you are doing home study. And specifically for our teenagers out there who have been home, um, having to go to school at home that aren't getting to go to band class, that aren't getting to have your performances, half your high school has been at home, not getting to have that ensemble, the band, like Joy was talking about. Um, we want to encourage you, we see you, we hear you, um, and know that there's a road and a path for you and your creativity and your dedication and your authenticity is what makes you fascinating where we're excited to have you on our film teams not where you come from but what you have to say about what you've been through musically is what gets us really excited to help you learn and grow so and that's exactly what i hear you saying joey so yeah yeah live your life i mean live a life and it's much more interesting to be with somebody for a long period of time that has lived a life than to just sit in a room talking about music <laughs> you know so true and what yeah. that music means to us so again joey newman i hope that you can hear virtually all the amazing applause um, <laughs> that pleasure. In this space. thank you for spending this time with us you're just so specific and helpful i know you've touched the people in the room and given some really pragmatic kind of abcs for our audience um thank you so much for spending this time with us and brother you know you just you're my fave, so it's, pleasure. it's such a pleasure. Always to share our, our vibe with everybody else. It's always a joy.
That's fun. I agree. I agree. Always have a great time with you, Kimberly. Thank you for this. And thank you, you Caroline and LA County Library for doing this event. I mean, I wish I wish there was like this stuff for me when I was a kid, you know, or when I was a teenager in high school. It would have been great. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So with that, everybody, again, um, I'm going to hand it back to Caroline, but thank you for taking the time to even come and invest in yourself. Um, and we'll be back in two weeks with another great uh, subject and group of people that Caroline's going to tell you all about. Thank you so much, Kimberly and Joey. Um, you all share such valuable information today and gave some amazing insight into the music world of the industry. It seems really big um, and really interesting. So thank you so much. And I'm so grateful to have you know your time here with us today. Um, for those of you watching, thank you for joining us. If you would like to explore more about the topics we discussed today, I will be email emailing out a list of resources, some of the stuff that um, was talked about today as well as some additional things um, as well as a recording of the presentation if you want to review the conversation and like Kimberly message uh, mentioned uh, this is a part of a series going on through May and our next event is on March 12th and is exploring the world of production design so the art department uh, you can visit our website at lacountylibrary.org slash creative dash careers to see the lineup we have coming up. And the website also has recordings and resources for past events in the series. So the one we did about music licensing, we did a video game one too. I know a few of you in the um, audience were uh, asking about video games. So check it out, um, see what we did in the past, see what we have coming up. Um, and if you're interested in participating in more of our upcoming virtual programs, please visit us at lacountylibrary.org. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.